Hey guys, in the last few tutorials we were looking at time series or sequences if you want to call it and we looked at traditional way of analyzing or forecasting a time series which is using ARIMA and then in the last tutorial we looked at neural networks how we can use those for time series prediction. Now the latest happening thing in sequences or analyzing sequences and forecasting is uh, recurrent neural networks specifically LSTM which I think is probably the most famous form of recurrent neural network. So let's spend a few minutes, hopefully not too long, understanding LSTM and then continue this time series forecasting in the next tutorial. And then in the one after that, let's see if we can actually apply LSTM to some sort of natural language uh, processing. I know these are all supposed to be like for researchers and uh, image processing, but if you think about it, uh, time series forecasting is part of any scientific research, you know, and natural language processing may not be, but if you really want to automate a system to read a whole bunch of papers for you and then prioritize the papers based on the content, then uh, just think of uh, writing some code for a natural language uh, processor, you know, to actually understand what's going on in the paper and then kind of summarizing it, even summarizing it for you, okay? But anyway, before we jump ahead uh, to all of that, let's uh, understand what LSTMs are. So first of all, let's uh, have a quick look at what our traditional deep learning is. Again, if you have watched uh, my previous videos, or if you come with this background, you know what we are talking about, which is a traditional deep learning is, okay, a specific example in this case, I have an image, what is it? Is it a cat or a dog? Classify it. So the way we deal with this when it comes to image analysis especially is uh, use convolutional filters. Why do we use convolutional filters? Because these are two-dimensional filters uh, that are convolutional filters, as the name suggests, and it extracts various features from the input image in a very cascaded way, in a step-by-step -step way, I should say here, and a patch is applied, features are extracted, and then we do some operations like max pools and others. Eventually, before it goes into this fully connected layer, we generate a whole bunch of features as inputs to this dense layer, or fully connected layer, or feed-forward layer, and then uh, uh, the information goes through in this direction, and eventually what comes out is a probability, uh, again, it depends upon what types of uh, uh, activation functions you're using, but typically a probability saying, okay, your cat, it's a cat with 80% and it's a dog 20%, so we finally say, okay, that's a cat. This is our traditional uh, deep learning, okay? So all the information it needs is in this image and all the information is transferred, you know, one after this other, I mean, in, in all these images, one after the other, and then they go in. So at no point, you can see the direction here of information travel from left all the way to the right, okay? But in a time series, uh, just the feed forward doesn't work. We also need to send some information back. So this neuron actually has an idea of what happened in the past, in the history, when information went from here to there. It may be confusing, but we'll get there, believe me. So the summary of this slide is recurrent neural networks are different from regular neural networks in the fact that they remember the past, okay? RNNs remember the past. That's the summary. Now, how do they do that or what do I mean by that? Like, why do we even need uh, uh, RNNs if we actually have, if, uh, you know, traditional neural networks? Well, think of this scenario. If I'm thinking about what's for dinner and if I have a pattern, I start a pattern on a Sunday. I say, okay, from now on, I'm going all Asian diet for the next couple of months. Today, I'm going to have, or on Sunday, I'm going to have Japanese, and then Chinese, and then Thai, and then Indian. And then I'll go back to Japanese, Chinese, Thai, Indian. Obviously, I'm traveling west. Okay? And so on. Okay? So I go through, I go through these. There is no pattern here with respect to the date. It's not like on Sundays I'm eating Japanese because if you look at Thai, I eat Thai on Tuesdays, on Saturdays, on Wednesdays, on Sundays, Thursday, Monday. So there is no correlation between these two columns. There is correlation between this column itself 
between different data points. This is what we call autocorrelation. I talked about this in the first video of this time series uh, tutorial. This is why we need RNNs because regular neural networks, the, the typically we have X, we have Y, X and Y, right? And uh, we are modeling this X to predict Y. But here we have to model Y to predict Y, okay? Uh, because what I'm going to eat tonight depends on what I ate yesterday and the day before, not on what day it is. I hope that point is clear here, okay? So that's, uh, RNNs are designed to make use of this type of sequential information, and let's see why, okay? Let's go through this step by step. Now, first of all, an RNN is, uh, if you see a diagram, a picture like this, by the way, I should credit numerous sources uh, I should have taken better notes to give proper credits here, but most of these images I completely took uh, from my Google image search. And uh, uh, go ahead and do Google image search for RNN, you'll find these pictures, okay? Now, if you unroll an RNN, okay, which is what happens during the execution, okay, during the training and prediction part, this is an RNN. As you can see, the input is coming from here and there is an output there, but then the information is traveling back within this cell. So this is a RNN cell. What happens? So the, if you unroll this, it's like the same network, there are multiple copies of the same network and each of this is passing on information to the next, okay? And you see how this is like a nice list-like structure or a sequence-like structure? That's why these are very good for sequences, okay? Let's dig a bit deeper now. Okay, so there are many, many types of RNNs, although LSTM is the most famous one, but let's understand. One-to-one -one is just like a regular neural network, okay? You have one input, one output, so it's like image classification, okay? Cat, dog. So that's a typical one-to-one. One-to-many -to -one. One -to is like image captioning. You supply an image, okay, a cat in front of a car, okay? So it's, it's, it's outputting a, uh, a sentence a cat in front of a car, okay? It's explaining a scene. So this is uh, one to many. Many to one is exactly opposite, which means there are multiple inputs and only one, uh, one output. So typically sentiment analysis. A bunch of tweets, for example, you supply a whole bunch of tweets on a specific hashtag. It says, well, it's not good, or wow, excellent, okay? Something good happened. So it, it's for sentiment analysis, you can use those type of RNNs. Uh, there is something called many-to-many, -many, and there are many variations of many-to-many, -many, okay? And this is for language translation. So if you supply like a sentence in English, it's giving an output in German, for example, okay? So that's many-to-many. -many. So there are many variations like this. Now, <laughs> I'm explaining the problem with RNN. Life is great, then why uh, do we need LSTMs? Well, if you look at this sentence, the sky is, I'm pretty sure most of you will answer by saying blue, unless you are in the San Francisco Bay Area, I, ca I cannot turn my camera, but the sky outside is red because of forest fires and everything. Anyway, if I give this sentence, the common answer is blue. So RNNs are excellent at doing this because very short sentence. If you have a long context, I think I did put this wildfires, yeah. So this is the 10th day of wildfires in the San Francisco Bay Area. There is smoke everywhere. It's snowing ash and the sky is, now the answer is red because there is some context here. So the sky is blue is probably not the answer, right answer here. How does an LSTM know this? It doesn't remember, I mean, how does an RNN know this? It doesn't remember uh, this much of this, okay? It looks at and the sky is, and then it's trying to fill this with blue, okay? This is a limitation. I'm not sure if that uh, explanation is clear enough, but the quick answer is a lot of previous information is necessary to get the answer right, okay? And RNNs, they fail. Theoretically, they should be able to do it, but apparently they fail, okay? This information is here about uh, wildfires, and the sky is information prediction is right here and it's getting it wrong. This is why LSTMs, uh, in fact, LSTMs, I think uh, I should have included historical information. The concept of LSTM was from 1990s. 
so it stands for long short term memory and of course it's designed to overcome the limitations of rnn which is gradient vanishing and exploding meaning the gradients uh, in the gradient descent they go to either zero or they explode all the way to infinity or if you want to say one is maximum so why again that's a different discussion so that's a problem and lstms are designed to overcome this uh, also rnns can be very complex to train and more importantly difficulty to process very long sequences which I just talked about here, okay? And remembering this type of long information is intrinsic to LSTM, okay? Again, please read papers on LSTM if you're curious about it, but I'm gonna explain it a little bit more in the next few minutes. This is a traditional RNN where information before is taken in and passed on to the information to the next cell with some operations happening in this cell, okay? What's happening in this cell? It's taking in information from here and also from the previous cell. And it's applying a tan H. Tan H is basically minus one to one, okay? And then sending the output, which means it is taking information from before, okay? So this is, this is what uh, RNNs are for. How does LSTM differ? <coughs> Excuse me. LSTM looks again, in, a, in an image, it looks somewhat like this. So it's not just a straight uh, tan H. Of course, you have that component here, but in addition, you have a sigmoid, a sigmoid, and a sigmoid right here, and a tan H over there. So let's deconstruct this and then look at this one at a time, okay? So a closer look. So first of all, if you look at this first uh, uh, part, in the top part, for example, you see the information is going in a straight line right there, and let's call that the cell state the state of the cell, okay? So it's in a certain state, and to that we are supplying, here we are multiplying whatever this value with the state value there. So the cell state is modified. If that value is one, then we are not modifying the state value. Here we are doing an addition right there, okay? So this is the state. Now what is this first part? This is uh, what we call a forget gate. <coughs> As the name suggests, gate means it lay either lets something in or doesn't let it in which means it helps us the forget gate okay it helps us in defining what information to forget what information to remember next gate input gate we'll look at this uh, in a minute and this also uh, obviously controls the amount of information that goes through and finally, the output gate. Also, we are doing some math before we send it to the output. So now let's actually look at this. The top part we already mentioned, uh, the information flows through this path, let's say, okay? So you have some information flowing through and the gates are letting the information through the cell state, okay? So the forget gate can be one and then it multiplies this information with one so nothing gets forgotten and everything goes through. Okay, so, and uh, uh, this is uh, the next gate and the next gate and so on. And you see the sigmoids and the tan H. And if you ask why sigmoid and why tan H, uh, then the answer is the sigmoid is outputting a value between zero to one, right? Sigmoid is like this S curve and the output is zero to one and it can be used to forget, remember information. Zero, okay, completely forget one, okay, just let everything through, right? So that's, that's why sigmoid is great. And tan H goes from minus one to one and it's a great function to actually add weight uh, to individual values, but uh, it's there to overcome the vanishing gradient problem, okay? Again, uh, if you look at sigmoid, for example, the second derivative, they do not sustain, uh, uh, you know, the first derivative is fine, but the second derivative goes to zero. So, but if you look at the tan H, the second deri derivative still sustains for a long range, even, uh, you know, uh, before going to zero, even for second derivative. If that doesn't make sense, fine. Let's move on and understand the forget gate, okay? <coughs> the math is right here because you have a sigmoid function, you have some input coming in, you have some uh, history information, historical information coming, coming in from the previous step, which is time t minus one, and then there is some sort of an output that you're multiplying to the, the, the in, uh, you know, the main information over there. So like I mentioned earlier, the outputs, it, uh, sigmoid outputs a number between zero and one, after this operation 
and this is for each number uh, it's how much information to keep and the next is the input gate down here of course what new information will be stored in the cell state because there is information coming in what new information will be stored in that cell state here we have a sigmoid and we have a tan h okay and don't worry if you don't understand any of this wait a couple more slides you'll see how easy the implementation is in keras but please try to understand what's going on at uh, inside lstm so the sigmoid layer decides which values are updated and the tan h layers are deciding the weight of each of these value okay so the importance of each of this value and moving on to the output gate which is the last one uh, down here again it has a sigmoid right there and the sigmoid decides which part is again selected for the output that's what sigmoid is and the tan h gives as usual the weights yeah the tan h right there gives the weights to this uh, to this uh, uh, um, to this in, uh, incoming values right there and then a multiplication operation right there and that's what's output you know that you get as an output right there so hopefully things make sense if you actually uh, uh, look at each of these it's basically a bunch of math going on information coming from here on when I say information a vector a bunch of numbers are coming from here a bunch of numbers are coming from here there is some math going on which is a sigmoid which goes from 0 to 1 and then there is a multiplication there information coming here and then a tan h type of activation uh, applied to that information and then this value is multiplied with this so you get an output right here so it's it's like looking at an engineering diagram right i mean you just follow through and hopefully things make sense okay how does it look in keras or in uh, programmatically if you look at this very simple we use sequential method just like we do for any other neural network uh, using keras and then instead of convert 2d convolutional or d uh, dense layers we are going to use lstm someone else already did the hard job of designing or defining this lstm so we just call that method okay so lstm how many units of lstms how many units right i mean i just showed you one unit of lstm how many units do you want in that layer so 50 in this example and uh, when you say return sequences equals to true that means yes return that so i can stack another lstm another lstm okay so that's what you do over there and because this is also the input taking an in input we are defining the input shape okay so you have your input layer and lstm to this uh, i mean dropout is regular dropout like regular neural networks meaning from this lstm to the next one i'm dropping 20 percent of the data and uh, keeping only uh, you know the remaining 80% this is optional depending on how your data looks next comes next LSTM same thing units equal to 50 return equals to true which means I'm providing another LSTM down here with a 50 so here this is a stack of three LSTMs and the output is a dense layer with unit equals to one which means my output is only one value after this okay so that's what this uh, and then the optimizer is Adam and loss is mean squared error which is very similar to what we have done in the previous tutorials uh, so the as you can see if you have done your regular neural network this is very similar except you're just using LSTM here that's it okay so uh, now uh, there are a few more variations of this LSTM go ahead and learn about bidirectional LSTM because LSTM we just talked about one unidirectional but if your series has meaning both in both directions like in the forward and back direction then bidirectional LSTM can be a useful one now convolutional LSTM is also something um, that's available as a single line you know that you can apply so go ahead and read about it in uh, the next video I'm going to demonstrate all of this on a time series data okay I'll probably include bidirectional and con LSTM whether I demonstrate or not I'll share the code so you can test it yourself okay so I really hope you found this tutorial to be educational and in the next tutorial let's apply this knowledge onto an actual uh, time series so we can do some forecasting thank you very much and please subscribe to this channel